What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access. Thank you guys for watching as always, and please be sure to hit that subscribe button right there. As you know, it's free, so we can keep coming to you guys with these phenomenal interviews with some of the icons of the game. So please be sure to subscribe, like, and share our content here at Unique Access Entertainment. Today, we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by one of the super great icons in the game, man. It's been a long time in the making, but we finally got it. Mr. Special Ed, thank you for coming through, sir. Peace, peace. How you doing? Man, everything is good. So thank you so much for uh, coming through here to Unique Access. We got so yeah, much. No worries. Yeah, so much to ask you about today, man. So we're going to take it from the top with Youngest in Charge, man. The uh, I was always intrigued because you and Howie T worked so well together on that project. How did you guys really meet and develop the bond to do that whole album? Well, how we work, how we lived across the street from my cousins. So I grew up uh, knowing them and kind of just watching them DJ because they used to like have a crew and make mixtapes and DJ in the backyard in the garage. So they used to always have to set outside and really be doing like recording mixtapes outside in the garage, in the driveway. Like it was special for me as a youth. So when I turned about 15, and I thought that I was ready for that studio life. I uh, asked my cousin Jennifer, one of my cousins that lived across the street from him, shout out to the Pike family. That's my cousins. And um, she took me to his house. And uh, I told him that I wanted to, you know, rap for him. And he looked at me kind of, you know, I was a skinny little 15 year old kid. And then um, he threw on Impeach the President. I told him oh, that's what I wanted to rap to. So, he looped up and pieced the president for me and I just went in. And after going in, um, they definitely realized what was going on. And then we started recording from there. Now at this time, uh, how, what were you thinking of his stuff with like Chub Rock that was already out and that was making it happen? Um, it was cool. It was cool. Chub Chub Rock was cool. I think Chub got a lot of a lot better and developed his style a lot more um, a few years after. I hear you. Now, getting to youngest in charge, the thing that I always thought was incredible was with taxing because the way that starts off the album, it's a lot like harder and sonically a lot darker than I'd say a lot of the album, but it's also one of my favorite songs. So from a sequencing perspective, why did you guys want that to be first? Well, Taxin was the first song I recorded. And it was my favorite song as well. So basically, it was just to set off the tone of the album and more so to let you know who I was as an artist because Taxin was more who I was at that time as an artist. Okay. The other songs were songs that we put together and many of them were, you know, lyrics and me as an artist but taxing kind of exemplified me at that time and the other thing i always thought was interesting too since the beat was so hard was uh how you kind of censored yourself by not cussing on the song so do you remember writing it how or why that happened that way what taxing yeah well all the lyrics are how i how i wrote them um but when I started recording, I had to be conscious of the content. Parental advisories began and things of that nature. And I just didn't want to bombard the project with a bunch of cussing and fussing. I cuss enough in regular life. <laughs> well, there it is. And then uh, I Got It Made, of course, is the you know, most famous song off the project, I would say, and probably your most favorite song, too. And the one thing outside of the song with the video, with the Army Brigade that, that shot in the video where everybody runs, yeah, that, that's one of my favorite scenes in a, any rap video. So how, how did that scene come about? Well, what happened was I invited a lot of different people from a lot of different parts of Brooklyn and a lot of different schools. Remember, we were all school age kids at the time. So we all met at Prospect Park and Prospect Park was a big park that we all were familiar with and came to. We had a big scene on um, the stairs at Grand Army Plaza 
there's probably about 50, 60 people up there dancing. And then we moved across the street to the park and that part of the song called for the Army Brigade. So uh, Chica Bruce, who directed that video, phenomenal job. You know, she's like immortalized with that. Uh, and, what you know, other projects too, but, you know, she definitely did that for me. And um, it just, you know, everybody was there already. So when they did the Army Brigade part, it made sense that, look, okay, boom, I'll give the cue and y'all do the rushing. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It's just uh, really amazing. And as far as lyrically, um, like the treaty with Tahiti and all the different extravagant things that you imagined, what was uh, in your mind as a writer? Like, how did you think of all these things? Well, what was in my mind as a writer is what would be uh, my style of luxury? What would be the things that I would like to attain? You know, I don't really do jewelry. I don't, I don't care about cars and jewelry. I like, you know, nice things, houses and properties and just, you know, things that I, I don't know other people might overlook or say that's a different goal but that's my only goal I don't I don't really go for that I don't do the bunch of fancy cars and chains and jewelry and diamonds that's for girls girls wear diamonds <laughs> yeah there you go so yeah. uh, also in 89 this was uh, I've always liked all types of rap, regardless of style or whatever, but I thought it was interesting that this was in 89 around the peak probably of the conscious era and your, this song was very, you know, materialistic, aspirational, different things. And I well, know well, my whole point with it was to inspire people to achieve and to want more and to raise their standards and um, raise their expectations in life. So it was just about raising the bar. And I felt like the only way to do that is to envision it, to speak it into existence. So that's what I did. And I think everyone that sang that song over and over again spoke it into existence. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's, I was curious as to why your interpretation that people didn't look at it, quote unquote, oh, he's just trying to, get a money grab or something. Cause I never looked at it that way, but I was curious. Yeah. Um, even now, money don't impress me. I've had money all my life. Money is not a, a an excitable thing to me. Family, people, life, love, you know, things that are real that you can't really buy. You understand? That's what's important. But, um, that was to really uplift uh, people in general, because at that time there was a lot of poverty, a lot of crack was the it was it was the crack era. So we had to get out of that mentally, physically, and spiritually. So that's what that was about, like upliftment. Okay, gotcha. Makes sense. Now, throughout the whole album. I think it's excellently produced. And with I'm the Magnificent, one of the things I really liked about that, that we used to have a lot, was at the end of the song, the beat just rides out, like the instrumental right. is playing. Right. So what was the decision to do that for you guys on I'm the Magnificent? Well, all the production on that album was Howie T. At all the decisions, mostly, and I did some uh, co-production, I'd call it, but to me, I was just picking out samples and saying, oh, I like that, or oh, use that, use that, which is production. But to me, coming in the game, I just wanted to keep it simple, let Howie do his job and let me do my job. So, um, you know, Howie's just amazing at, at production, period. You know, he had a slew of other hits that he already produced, and I know how to pick music. So I just picked the beats that I was, like, attracted to and drawn to. Gotcha. Now, mm -hmm. with the uh, club scene, I, I like that song for a lot of different reasons. One was the interplay with Kazam, the male-female dynamic, and that was early in the game. You know, we'd heard UTFO, Roxanne, Roxanne, go, real Roxanne, go back and forth a little bit, but we hadn't heard many 
male female collaborations other than Funky Four plus one more, probably not that many. So what? Well, well what it was was um, that was uh, that that's Howie's daughter's mom. So they were together, and she was doing an album project, and um, I was writing. I was kind of like just helping out and writing some uh stuff for her as well and i did write something for the real roxanne as well and i never got paid when i was 15 years old i wrote a record for her fred Mineo never paid me and my credit is right on the back of the album on select records on select records it's called don't even feel it right it's on the real roxanne's album so i wrote that is written by e arch i was 15 years old the child labor laws involved there's all kind of stuff involved. Where my bread? <laughs> so how did that how did that end up happening writing for her? Well, Howie was producing her album. And I was doing my album and then I was also writing some stuff for Kazan. So he asked me if I wanted to write some stuff for the real Roxanne. And I was like, hell yeah. And for me, it wasn't really based on the money, but just to come to find out you you made me work and then you don't, you know, you didn't pay me. So that was an issue. But otherwise, I, I ain't really care. How, how much did they really make off of that? You understand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that album, unfortunately, didn't do very well, even though there's some really good stuff on there. But mm -hmm. what can we do? Now, as far as um, club scene this, itself as a song, though, that was also, you know, a house song and it had a, uh, a lot of different uh, beat changes and it's a long song and all these different things and it's also yeah. a song well that's... it had all the, it had all the elements of a house song so house songs were long and what we wanted to do was take all the uh the popping club hits and sample them and put them all in one song so this way it had to win like you somewhere somebody had to win off of that because it had so many of the hit club songs of that day in it yeah <laughs> and um really we, we just wanted to diversify my thing when making albums is give everybody a song so i had songs for everybody i had a reggae song i had taxing i had i got it made i had uh songs for the women songs for the kids for the you know every every genre yeah i think that's one of the great things about youngest in charge is the diversity it's not a super long album as far as time wise but right it definitely has different a variety of different type of styles of music and songs. Yeah, like the hoedown, for instance. The hoedown was, uh, aside from Wild Wild West, I, I would consider that the first country western rap song, period. Because uh, except Mo D, he did Wild Wild West. Other than that, hoedown was it, and I used the actual uh, banjo in it. Yeah, yeah, that was a real uh, banjo sample. So. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I can appreciate all the uh, artists that are venturing into other genres at this time, but we did that shit 30 years ago. Yeah, because sonically, the whole down, I, I appreciated the play on words, I guess. <laughs> right, 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 right. And you know what? I heard it. I had rhymes like that. And then when I heard the banjo playing, I was like, damn, it had a little beat to it. And I was like, oh, shit, that's, that beat is hot. But I'm like, what am I going to do to that? And then I started thinking, and then I was like, and I heard it, and it said, hold down, go hold down. And I was like, hold down. It's like, oh, I know some hoes. <laughs> so I just put those lyrics to it, but you know, it was all in fun. I really don't um, make stuff like that anymore that's um, degrading to women. But when I was a child, it was funny to me. So I did it, and I loved it, and I still love it. I think it's one of um, one of my creative uh, wordplay songs because yeah. I went off into so much leading you in one direction and then bringing you into another with the wordplay. So, yeah, I loved Hold Down. So as a writer, Hold Down, as a writer, what type of satisfaction does that give you to kind of give the audience a little misdirection? Well, um, well, it's not really misdirection. It's more so like you always think you know what's coming next. Mm. 
and you really don't. You know what I'm saying? It's like, especially in hip hop, you think you know the next rhyme, you know the next word, when we can change that up and throw you off mentally. So that's what I do. I'm just uh, a little, a little diverse, uh, a little abstract with the lyrics because I, I don't just keep it straight in A, B, C, D, one, two, three. I take you all over the place. How do you think? And I like to provoke thought. Right. Speaking of that, Think About It is probably one of my other top favorite songs on there. And the thing that was so intriguing about that is that the throughout this whole album, you guys really changed the length of the verses, the style of the verses, whether they're super short or longer, in and out. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what happened with that. Well, mainly the first album, there were a few songs that, uh, put it like this. When I came into the studio, I was raw. I was just writing rhymes and spitting verses and how he kind of had to direct me as to counting bars, as to verses, as to choruses and sequencing and structure of a song. I was just rhyming. I was battling in the street, battling in school, rhyming, 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 and I never made a record. So when it finally came time to me from, to make records, he taught me how to count out the bars and how many bars were required per verse for the hook, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I did music in school, so, you know, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a difficult to keep up with, you know, because I played trumpet and sax. So I read, read sheet music, I counted bars, I did all of that. But when it came to actually recording vocal as a vocalist, I wasn't familiar with the uh, bar structure. So he, he definitely put me onto that. So that's why some of the first songs that I recorded, like Taxin, I Got It Made, Think About It, I'm the Magnificent, um, shit, maybe even Hold Out. But if you really check them out, none of them are really standard 16 bar structure with eight or four bar choruses they're they're just me spitting and i stopped when i stopped and we put a, a verse we put a hook in it. you know but when i stopped rhyming if it was even like if it was correct bar wise how he would just leave it and then he'd tell me look the, the chorus has to be this long or he'd put the chorus on himself you know what I'm saying? And I come back and it'd be like, oh, okay, nice. You know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, I was, you know, I didn't know how to put records together until how we showed it. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV is just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.